Welcome to this Yale Center Beijing event on Wrong But Useful, Why Experts Have Blind Spots, which is also part of the Greenberg Distinguished Colloquium. I am Carolee Rafferty, the Executive Director of Yale Center Beijing and a Yale College alumna. For those of you who might be new to Yale Center Beijing, uh, the center is Yale University's only university-wide center outside of its U.S. campus. Throughout the year, we host talks such as these, convening thought leaders from all sectors to discuss the most cutting edge, interesting, and important matters in our world. Today, um, we have the pleasure of being able to invite Professor James Choi to speak about his work on behavioral finance and economics, especially drawing on a paper he wrote that has gone viral titled Popular Personal Finance Advice versus the Professors. Professor James Choi read 50 best-selling personal finance books in the United States, compared their advice to normative principles drawn from economic theory and published, published the results in this paper. Professor Choi is a professor of finance at the Yale School of Management, whose work has led to changes in pension plans uh, designs, uh, plan, pension plan designs around the world. Among his many accolades and roles, he is a two-time recipient of the TIAA Paul A. Samuelson Award for Outstanding Scholarly Writing on Lifelong Financial Security, and he is a co-director of the Retirement and Disability Research Center at the National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States. Today's event will proceed as follows. Professor Choi will give a presentation and then I will moderate the audience Q&A session afterwards. Throughout the talk, if you have any questions that you'd like to pose to Professor Choi, please feel free to type them in the Zoom chat box and um, I'll keep an eye on them and select them and post them to Professor Choi during the Q&A. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Choi. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. As Carol mentioned, recently a paper I published unexpectedly went viral. An email went out to the world from the National Bureau of Economic Research at 12.57 a.m. on August 22nd, listing my paper and its abstract along with 21 other papers in, in this one email. At 8.34 a.m. that same day, a journalist emailed me asking, if I'd be willing to be interviewed about the paper. So at 10, 15 a.m., I spoke with this journalist as I was being driven to JFK Airport uh, in New York, where I was catching a flight. At 1.20 p.m. that same day, while I was on my flight, another journalist emailed me asking me if I'd be willing to be interviewed for a radio show. And that was really just the beginning. Uh, over the course of the next two months, I was interviewed by many other journalists and appeared in multiple podcasts, even a couple of TV shows to talk about my paper. This uh, is not the usual reaction to papers that I publish. Usually the broader world does not prepare, uh, pay much attention to academic research papers. And so, you know, why was this paper the one that generated so much interest? Uh, as Carol mentioned, the paper's title is Popular Personal Financial Advice Versus the Professors. The idea was very simple. Economists have all sorts of theories about what the right thing to do is in your personal financial life. But there's a parallel universe of people out there who are also giving advice about how you should manage your finances. These people appear on TV and radio uh, in the US. They're people like Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman uh, on the left in the center here, or Jack Bogle the founder of the mutual fund giant Vanguard. These people are probably way more influential than any economist. Let's take Dave Ramsey, for example. He sold uh, one and a half million copies of his book, Total Money Makeover, since 2013. 18 million people listen to his radio show every week, which maybe isn't that many people in China, but it's a lot of people in the US. Uh, he's uploaded many of his radio shows to YouTube and people have viewed those videos almost 650 million times. So the idea of my paper was pretty simple. 
let's just summarize the advice given in the 50 most popular personal finance books and compare that advice to the advice that is given by academic economic theory. I mean, shouldn't we economists know what these other people who are kind of in the same business that we're in and are very influential, shouldn't we know what the other people are saying? And I discovered that people are very interested in somebody making that connection between these two parallel worlds of advice. And you know, it wasn't just journalists and their readers. I had a lot of economics and finance professors from around the US email me telling me how much they liked this paper. And again, this is not the usual reaction to papers I publish. Usually the reaction is just silence. Now, today's talk is actually not primarily about this paper. This is a talk about the question, why didn't anyone else think to write this paper before? This was not a paper that required a high IQ to write. It's on topic that's of great interest to a lot of people. Didn't take a lot of money to buy these 50 books. They're sold for pretty cheap. Uh, there are a lot of economists out there who could have written this paper. Why didn't they? Now, I don't know everything that's going on in the lives and brains of other economists, so I can't provide a definitive answer. But I do have a theory, and it's a theory that explains why experts so often have blind spots about their own areas of expertise. My theory is this. There was a famous statistician, George Box, who had a famous saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. When experts first start getting trained in their field, they see that the field's models, that is the field's theories, are wrong. They're not totally accurate. But they're drawn into the field because they also see that the field's models, the field's theories are useful. And as they spend more and more time in their field and start becoming an expert in it, they forget the first part of this sentence. They forget that their model is wrong. Why are all models wrong? Well, in order for a model or a theory to perfectly match what's in the world, that model would have to be as complicated as the world. But a model that complicated would be too complicated for us to understand. So that kind of a model would actually provide no insight. In order for a model to be useful, it has to simplify reality. But if it's a simplification of reality, it's not going to perfectly reproduce reality. And so that's why all models are wrong. But some models are useful. So let's talk about a workhorse model in economics that is clearly wrong. Economists model people as having what we call a utility function, which you can kind of think of as being like a happiness function. So here's a graph of a simple utility function. On the horizontal axis is how much money does the person have? And the vertical axis represents how happy the person is. Uh, so this utility person uh, function shows that the person gets super unhappy if the money he has drops towards zero and he gets happier as he gets more money. Economists say that people make choices as if they maximize their expected level of happiness as represented by a function like this. All right, how does this work? There's a little bit of math in this slide, but don't worry, this is you know, just a little bit of math in the talk. If you don't quite follow what I'm about to say on the slide, you'll still be able to understand the rest of this talk. But you know, let's just kind of walk through this for about 45 seconds. Uh, let's say that you have a person that's making a choice between getting 100 yuan for sure or playing a gamble that has a 50% chance of giving her 50 yuan and a 50% chance of giving her 160 yuan. Which of these is she going to choose, the safe option or the gamble? Economists say, let's suppose that this person has that utility function, that happiness function I just showed you on the prior slide. So you plug in numbers into that function. And so what is the utility of having 100 UN? Well, it turns out with that function, it's 4.61. 
So getting 100 UN for sure gives the person a happiness level of 4.61. If the person chooses to gamble, she has a 50% chance of getting the utility associated with getting having 160 UN or a 50% chance of utility of getting a, a 50 UN. And again, if it so, hap it so happens that if you have the utility function on the prior graph, 160 UN gives you a happiness level of 5.08, and 50 UN gives you a utility level of 3.91. You just do the arithmetic, and so the expected utility, or the average amount of happiness you would get from taking that gamble is 4.49. So we compare this average level of happiness with this level of happiness, and you see the 4.61 is bigger than 4.49. So this person's going to choose the safe option instead of taking the gamble. Now, you might say that this is an incredibly impoverished, inaccurate way of thinking about how real people make choices about risk, and you would be right. There is a ton of evidence that people do not make choices about risk in this way. Expecting utility theory, which I have just described, is wrong. But there are hundreds of thousands of economics papers that have been written using expected utility theory because it is a useful way to represent human decision making. And so economists have collectively agreed that if we see a paper presented that uses expected utility theory, we almost never will derail the entire presentation from the very beginning by raising our hands saying, don't you know that expected utility theory is wrong? We have collectively decided we are going to ignore this wrongness because it allows us to get some other insights. But this raises a question. If all models are wrong, who gets to decide what models aren't too wrong? If some models are useful, who gets to decide which models are useful enough? This really highlights the fact that all knowledge creation is a social process. A community of researchers together decides which models aren't too wrong and which models are useful enough. And of course, the leaders of these communities are going to have a disproportionate influence in making these types of decisions. If all models are wrong, but we're going to accept some of them as useful, that means that we're going to make decisions about what kinds of disconfirming evidence are not to be taken too seriously. And the most famous example in economics of disqualifying entire classes of evidence comes from the Nobel laureate Milton Friedman. Friedman told a famous or infamous parable about modeling the shots of an expert billiards player. He said that the best model for predicting these shots assumes that the expert billiards player knows the laws of physics and chooses his shots accordingly. But Freeman wrote, the billiards player, if you ask him, how do you decide where to hit the ball, may say that he just figures it out, but then also rubs a rabbit's foot just to make sure. So according to Friedman, it's actually useless to ask people how they make economic decisions what they say has no value as evidence for evaluating our theories. The only evidence that matters is actions and how well our theories predict those actions. So within any discipline, economics, sociology, chemistry, medicine, there are norms that have been established about which models aren't too wrong, which models are useful enough, and what types of evidence have value. And this is why interdisciplinary research is so hard. Economists and sociologists, we study a lot of the same phenomena. But if you try to get an economist and a sociologist to work together on a research project, chances are that they won't get very far because they just can't agree on these basic ground level questions. What kinds of wrongness are they willing to tolerate? What dimensions of usefulness are really valuable? And what kinds of evidence to be paid attention to, what kinds of evidence should be ignored. All models are useful or are wrong, but some are useful. The problem is that as experts spend 
more time in their field, they forget the first part of the sentence. The models they're using are actually wrong. Philip Tetlock is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his PhD in psychology from Yale back in 1979. Uh, he is one of the greatest social scientists of our era. Tetlock has spent decades studying the ability to predict the future. He recently published a book called Super Forecasting, the Art and Science of Prediction, which summarizes uh, this work of his life. And my thinking has been deeply influenced by this book, so I highly recommend it. One of the main ways Tetlock studied the ability to forecast the future was by running forecasting contests. He would ask contestants to make predictions about really difficult things, like uh, will Serbia be officially granted European Union candidacy by December 31st, 2011? Will either the French or Swiss inquiries find elevated levels of polonium in the remains of Yasser Arafat's body? Will the London gold market fixing price of gold exceed 1,850 US dollars on September 30th, 2011? What Tetlock found was that some people are persistently better forecasters than others. And shockingly, subject matter experts are not particularly good at forecasting in their own area of expertise. Tetlock writes that the average expert was roughly as accurate as a dart throwing chimpanzee in his or her own area of expertise. In fact, the contestants who are really good at forecasting, he calls them super forecasters, are better at predicting the future than experts in their own domain of expertise. Why are some people better forecasters than others? And why are experts so bad at forecasting in their own domain of expertise? Tetlock found that there are actually two approaches to forecasting by thinking about the world, two types of forecasters. He labels them foxes and hedgehogs, inspired by a line written by the ancient Greek poet Archilochus, who wrote, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Hedgehog forecasters know one big thing. They have one grand theory that informs all that they do and say. Foxes know many little things. They draw from many sources of information and they combine many sources into a single conclusion. They're less confident. They're less likely to say something is certain or impossible. It turns out the foxes are superior forecasters. And experts are bad at forecasting because they tend to be hedgehogs. They forget that their own grand theory is actually wrong. So they ignore all the other approaches to knowledge, all the other opinions, all the other sources of information outside of their discipline when making forecasts. Let me illustrate how hedgehogs go astray and how foxes do better in a financial domain predicting the stock market's return, which of course everybody is, is kind of interested in. Uh, this is a study that was published by uh, David uh, Raypatch, Jack Strauss, and Gold Food Zoe in 2010. They take 15 variables that have been proposed in the academic literature as being potential predictors of future stock market returns. They form forecasts of the following form. The return in quarter T plus one will be some constant A plus a constant B times the value of the predictor variable in the prior quarter T. Now they form these forecasts using only historical data up to date T. So let's just illustrate what they're doing here. Suppose they're studying some predictor X and what the first thing they're gonna to try to do is to predict the stock market's return in the first quarter of 1965, using the value of X in the fourth quarter of 1964. They have data going back to 1947. And so what information would an investor who actually was living in the fourth quarter of 1964 have? Well, that investor would only have data from 1947 
1964, that investor would not have data from future years. So the authors find the values of A and B in this equation that produce the smallest deviations from actual terms in the data from 1947 to 1964. So then they use these values of A and B to predict the 1965 first quarter return of the stock market. Okay, so they'll make a guess. And then, you know, of course the guess won't be perfect. So there's gonna be some error to that guess. Now they try again to predict the stock market's return, but in the following quarter. So they'll try to predict the stock market's return in the second quarter of 1965. And now using the value of X in the first quarter of 1965. But now an investor who was actually alive in the first quarter of 1965 has data from 1947 up to the first quarter of 1965. And so they're going to estimate new values of A and B, kind of taking into account this additional data that the, uh, that the investor at that time would have had access to. And so they keep on repeating this procedure for every quarter until the end of their data in 2005. And so this is mimicking the experience of an investor who's trying to make investment decisions in real time using the historical evidence that is available to that investor. So this is, you know, just, you know, a little bit sophisticated, not very sophisticated. Let's think about, you know, the simplest, dumbest way you could go about trying to predict the stock market's return, which is uh, I'm sitting uh, today and my guess for next quarter stock market return is just the average return that the stock market has historically experienced up to today. Okay, so that's my dumb, you know, low IQ way of, uh, of predicting the stock market's return. The finding is that none of the 15 variables that are that have been proposed uh, up to the point where this study was, was, uh, was published outperforms a guess that is just the historical stock market average return. So predicting the stock market's return is really hard. But you take each of those 15 predictions and you take the average of those predictions, that average actually uh, does better than any of those individual predictions. And it does better than simply guessing the historical average return of the stock market. So this is kind of a fox's approach to predicting the stock market going forward. Why does this average of the 15 predictors do such a good job of predicting next quarter stock market return? I think it's illuminating to see what the individual predictions look like over time. So what you have here is uh, 15 different graphs and each of the graphs shows you over time, what do these particular predictors uh, uh, say that the stock market's return in the next quarter is going to be? And uh, you know, it's not really important what these particular variables are for the purposes of this talk. What I want to point out is that uh, there's a lot of volatility in these predictions. So you know, you take a look at this one, for example. You know, the prediction is kind of all over the place; it moves around a lot. Well, the stock market's return uh, is really hard to predict. So if you make a really extreme prediction, or if the statistical model makes a really extreme prediction, what that essentially is is a very confident prediction that the stock market's return is going to deviate from its historical mean. And because the stock market's return is hard to predict, you can tend to have a lot of really big misses if your predictions are moving around extremely over time. Now, in contrast, the forecast that averages together the 15 individual forecasts is pretty smooth. And that smoothness helps its forecasting performance. The Fox acknowledges that there is a lot of uncertainty in the world, so it tends not to make very confident extreme predictions. There is an easy way to misinterpret uh, what I have just shown you. So uh, the wrong lesson to take away from this uh, is the following, that you should create a more complicated model that includes all 15 predictor variables 
simultaneously. In other words, look at the historical data up to today and find the values of B1, B2, you know, B3, all the way to B15 that create the best historical fit between quarter T plus one's return and a weighted sum of all 15 predictors. And then use this estimated relationship to predict next quarter stock market return. This complicated model turns out to have the worst predictive performance of all the models that are tested. And you can see why in this graph, that dashed line shows that the complicated model uh, generates really, really volatile forecasts. And what's going wrong here is that you gave the model a lot of flexibility to fit the historical data. It had 15 different levers that it could pull in order to match the predict the historical data really, really closely. And so what the model ends up doing is it mistakenly thinks that random unpredictable noise in the historical data was in fact predictable using that combination of 15 predictor variables, when in fact the noise and the predictor variables sometimes moved in the same direction only by chance. So you're fitting the noise in the data and noise doesn't kind of repeat from, from period to period. And so this is, is a graph where it's clear uh, that there is a linear relationship between the horizontal axis variable and the vertical axis variable. So basically, it, it's kind of this linear uh, relationship between the y-axis and the, and the, and the, and the x-axis, but then there is some random deviations from that linear relationship. But if you give the model a lot of flexibility to fit the data, then indeed the model is going to fit that data perfectly. So that blue line that you see uh, runs through every single one of those data points in the historical data perfectly. It just goes right through. But now if you try to predict the future using this complicated model, you'll end up making kind of some crazy predictions because the model has overfit the data, it has fit the noise, and that noise is not representative of what's going to happen in the future. You, what you should have done is just use the simple linear model and uh, predicted using that simple model instead of the complicated model. Now, a, an economist who wants to be a fox when thinking about economics should listen to what non-economists have to say about economics. And so that's what I was trying to do when I read those popular personal finance books. So what did I learn? I learned that popular authors often give advice that is very different from what economists advise. And the most important difference arises, I think, because when economists create theories about what the right thing to do with your money is, we assume that you have perfect discipline, that you have no problem sticking with a plan and executing it. If economists were giving diet and exercise advice, it's like our entire research enterprise is only producing advice on how Olympic athletes should eat and train. But you know, most people aren't Olympic athletes. They don't have the willpower and the dedication that Olympic athletes have. They aren't willing or able to make the same sacrifices as Olympic athletes. In fact, even uh, the actor uh, Dwayne Johnson, also known as The Rock, he is you know, famous worldwide for his muscular physique. He says that he needs to have his cheat meals, wildly unhealthy meals where he doesn't have to control his eating. Why are the cheat meals so essential? It's so that he can maintain his discipline for all of the other meals that he eats. So he says, you know, for me, the cheat meals is like church. You work out hard and once a week you treat yourself. So in personal finance, what are the cheat meal equivalents that enable ordinary people to stick to a plan and actually have some scientific evidence that backs up their efficacy? Economists just aren't researching this at all. Recently, I was interviewed for uh, one of those podcasts about my paper on personal uh, popular personal finance. And the podcast also interviewed this guy, Morgan Housel. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Psychology of Money. 
Now, remember at the beginning of this talk, I remember that this guy, Dave Ramsey, is one of the most popular providers of personal financial advice in the U.S., it turns out that Dave Ramsey gives a lot of advice that economists would totally disagree with. But Morgan Housel said, how many people has Dave Ramsey helped out of debt versus the average academic economist? It's a million to one. And you know what? He is absolutely right. Imagine you know, if doctors gave no diet recommendations for people who were struggling with their body weight. So that the only diet advice that was available in the world for such people who are struggling with their weight came from TV and radio show hosts, popular book authors, and social media influencers. That's kind of the situation we're in right now with personal finance advice. The economists are just missing from the scene. So the only place people who are having trouble with their personal finances can get advice from is the non-economists. By reading non-economist financial advice, I learned that economists should devote more energy to learning what motivates people to stick to a financial plan. I learned that we should think harder about how financial plans should be adapted in light of the fact that people have limited motivation. I learned that popular authors commonly believe that good financial behaviors are built up through habit and practice, like a virtue. So if you are going to be a saver someday, you have to start saving today. You can't just not save for a while and then suddenly expect to be able to, to, to save a lot of money in the future. Now, is that true? Uh, I don't know, but maybe economists should be testing whether that's true or not. And if it is true that saving or investing is like a virtue, then how does that change the advice that economists give about how you should save and invest over the course of your life. All models are wrong, but some are useful. The world is too complicated to understand without simplified models. So we need to tolerate wrongness in our models to make progress. But we should never forget that the model we are using to interpret the world is actually wrong. So we should be like the fox, periodically look up, and incorporate information and opinions from other approaches to knowledge, because being like the hedgehog and using only one single grand theory of everything is going to cause us to perform poorly. Thank you. Wow, that was so interesting. Um, and I think people were shy about um, <laughs> punching in uh, questions in the chat box. So I will start by um, asking some questions. And for those of you who would like to ask um, Professor Choi questions, please feel free to uh, type them in the chat box. Now, I was struck by many slides and uh, many of the um, ideas you shared, um, including from the beginning, knowledge creation is a social process. So I'm curious to know um, if in your research and in, in what you've come across um, in academia, um, in, in terms of um, studies on, let's say, asset prices or stock prices, um, has it become, or has it always been a social process um, with the meme stocks and you know all, all the things that are happening that have captured the media's attention lately? Yeah, I, mean, I think cer certainly it's been a social process, and there are, you know, I, I, I kind of talk about the mating dance. So you know, you you watch nature documentaries and. Uh, when birds are, are mating, the, the male bird has to do a certain elaborate dance, a pre-specified dance, so that the female will be willing to mate with the male bird. And so similarly, in you know, asset pricing research, for example, uh, there are certain types of questions where if you want to convince your audience that your approach is correct, you have to do your own mating dance, where the steps are qu actually quite pre-specified. And you have to do all those steps correctly in order for uh, your the, the reader or the audience to think, okay, this person is legitimate. They're doing all the right things. And in fact, many of the steps are actually quite arbitrary and, and they were established because some famous old guys long ago decided to do it this way. And so then uh, the papers will lean on the authority and say, well, just like we follow so-and-so uh, and we do this and we 
adopt these procedures because this famous paper did that. Uh, and you know that it's really just an accident of history, and there's no particular reason why you necessarily had to do it in that way. And then you know there there are all sorts of reasons why those approaches we know that those approaches are flawed, that they have uh, uh, blind spots, and, and again we uh, have collectively agreed to ignore those deficiencies because again you can just derail the entire paper the entire seminar presentation by asking very very basic questions making very very basic objections and so in, indeed i think that that um that uh there is a very social process and and you know for a long time the notion that markets are efficient that prices are on average correct for all securities was Kind of the, the accepted dogma in in the academic finance research profession, and so it was very difficult to publish papers that said, uh, you know, this security is underpriced, and so you could get a particularly good return by investing this in this type of security. No, 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 you're not allowed to say that. What you have to say is, oh, there must be something particularly risky about these securities, such that on average they have high prices. But of course. That doesn't mean that these securities are good deals, just means that they're secretly risky. And over time, that thinking was able to be shifted, but it took a long time. And I think it, it was a social process. And now I think it's much more acceptable to, to write papers that are along those lines. And so absolutely, it, it is a social process, just like uh, any other field of human inquiry. Um. We have an interesting question from the audience asking, um, is your talk um, kind of, I guess, a snapshot of what behavioral economics the field is about? I think so. I mean, I think that there there is uh, this, well, so, so there, there are, you know, let, let, let's talk about my talk and then let's talk about the paper that, that kind of was the inspiration for the, the rest of the talk. Uh, so, I think that the kind of the social aspect of, of knowledge creation, I think that there is very much a behavioral economics component to it, because if we were all perfectly rational and infinitely sophisticated, we wouldn't have to make these uh, shortcuts uh, to accept wrongness in our models, to have models be very simple. We would just know how the world is actually structured, and we would make predictions and, and, and form theories along those lines. And so I think that there is an aspect of that. And then, you know, uh, kind of the deference to authority and, and you know, if the authority uh, leaders of a particular discipline are mistaken, then the entire field can kind of go in the wrong direction for a couple of decades. And I think that there, you know, economists have studied herd behavior, where if the first mover in a sequence of movers goes in the wrong direction, everybody just follows that person, uh, you know, assuming that the first mover had some special information. So, uh, you know, and of course, there's a, a lot of application there to stock prices. And, you know, you see the stock has, this stock has risen a lot. Oh, you know, it must be a, a good investment. Just turned out that it went up for random reason, but now you got a big herd of people kind of going into the stock and, um, you know, kind of pushing it up and, and causing it to be overvalued, for example. So that's kind of on, on the knowledge creation uh, portion. And then I think on the kind of the personal finance portion, absolutely, I think that uh, one, you know, so I am a behavioral economist. Uh, a lot of my research has been on dumb things people do with their money. And there are particular biases that have kind of been studied for decades now. And, and so we, even behavioral economists, we tend to fixate on a particular set of biases because these are the biases that became famous in the 1970s and the 1980s. And, and so when we see new phenomena, we were always kind of referring back to those types of biases. What I found uh, relatively new when I you know, read these popular books is that they were referring to a whole other set of kind of human weaknesses that behavioral economics, frankly, has not thought a lot about. So, you know, I, I get discouraged from uh, pursuing my financial goals because I have a temporary setback, right? I broke a personal rule that I had for myself. And so now my entire debt repayment plan, uh, I, I end up abandoning it. 
So these kind of motivational uh, uh, factors is not something that behavioral economists have historically thought a lot about. Um, uh, people, you know, some of these books say you should not invest 100% of your portfolio in the stock market because you can not psychologically handle uh, the risks that are associated with 100% stock allocation. And, you know, this, this is actually a, a fairly different approach than behavioral economics has taken where, you know, we don't really haven't historically thought a lot about people just getting scared uh, when and discouraged from their investing plan when they experience a temporary setback. And we, we talk about loss aversion and, oh yeah, we don't like it when, when our, you know, we lose money, we, we dislike losses more than we like gains, that sort of thing. But it's not a very uh, emotional, motivational approach to uh, the way we think about personal investing, personal uh, financial decisions. And so absolutely, I think there's a, there's a, a behavioral economics uh, angle to the approach that I discovered in these personal, popular personal finance books, but really a, a different flavor than what we behavioral economists have been obsessing over for the last 40 or so years. I see there's a hand. Thanks for the answer. Um, I see that uh, Feng Liu has her hand up, so I'm gonna unmute her to ask the question. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Choi. Um, this is from, from your school management and just graduated in May. So what you are sharing tonight just make me feel back, go back to your school management again. So appreciate it. Welcome that. at any time. <laughs> yeah. And I also want to say that what you have shared also make me, you know, think about the behavior economics since I I also learned this class at your school management. Um, but you shared from another angle, which uh, is really impressive. Um, my question is, I'm curious for the people who lack a professional financial background or knowledge, you know, how do they know these uh, models works or not? How do they know these models right or not? And how do we know, um, um, you know, in terms of investment or decision making, how can we, how the people who lack this knowledge can take advantage of these models? I think this is a, a really hard uh, <laughs> question in life. So, for example, yeah. I know nothing about cars. So, mm -hmm. if I take my car into the mechanic and the mechanic wants to defraud me and so just make me do all these repairs that aren't necessary. I'm just going to get defrauded because I don't know anything about cars. Now, similarly, for somebody who doesn't know anything about finance, how can they uh, evaluate the financial advice that's coming to them? I, th I think it's very, very difficult. And even uh, if you try to rely upon what, what your friend's uh, experience was with, with the financial advisor, actually, that's not particularly uh, accurate. So there are, you know, basically financial, professional financial advisors are in the business of making you feel good, of making you feel confident in them, which is quite a different thing than actually giving you good advice. And we see this in the medical field as well, that there are certain doctors that have very good bedside manners. So they make you feel good as a patient, they make you feel cared for, but in fact, they're giving you, you know, very poor treatment. The correlation between these two things is, is very, very weak. So, you know, I think that, there is, uh, you know, no perfect substitute for having a little bit of information or learning uh, yourself. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that when when it came to uh, these books and why did I choose the fifty most popular finance financial uh, advice books, and, and you know, take some of the advice actually fairly seriously, is that these are books that have passed some sort of market test. So enough people found what they wrote compelling that maybe there's some truth in there. And when I read these books, I did think there's a lot of stuff in here that I think is just false and wrong, but there's a kernel of truth in them in that they are addressing a particular, particular felt need in the population of their readers that we as economists need to take seriously. So again, come, coming back to this example of, uh, you know, there, there are certain ways that economists say you should get out of debt. So for example, 
concentrate on paying your highest interest rate debts first. This, this is like kind of very basic economic uh, advice. It's just, you know, you do your arithmetic and you realize that's the cheapest way to get out of debt. You pay down your highest interest rate debt first. What a lot of these popular uh, authors advise you to do is to pay down the debt that has the smallest balance first, even if it's not your highest interest rate debt. And they say that the reason you should do this is that if you can get a debt balance down to zero, that's going to be really motivating for you. It's going to be like, wow, I just accomplished something. I feel good. I'm making progress on my debt repayment plan. And therefore, that's going to allow you to continue on your debt repayment plan and finish it. And so just you know, going back to the diet analogy, the best diet is a reasonable diet that you can stick with. So there are perfect diets that you can't stick with. Those aren't good diets. You need a diet that you can stick with. And so a lot of, uh, of I think, these deviations uh, from kind of the perfect economic advice that I saw was about kind of maintaining that motivation. And so I think uh, there is something to be learned from that. And so even if you, uh, you know, you're going out and you're, you're looking for some financial advice yourself, and you see there's a certain theme that kind of comes up over and over again across many different sources. And, you know, even if that advice is technically wrong, there may be some wisdom in that uh, that I think uh, we can learn from. Um, that's so interesting. And, and thanks for thanks to Feng Liu's question. Um, I actually have a follow up question to her question, which is um, based on what you shared as um, the, you know, the best predictor of future stock market returns is actually more an average of all the um, ind indicators rather than any of the indicators themselves. Um, do you think that with professional investing as if um, you know, quant funds or hedge funds, um, does it, it does it work that way where models that are more complex and take into account more factors, do those models tend to do better uh, in terms of um, investment returns? Um, so the average of everybody's investment decisions is basically the overall market, right? And so there's there's a, a huge amount of evidence, at least in the U.S. markets, that passive index funds that are just trying to match the overall stock market's return rather than beat the stock market returns can outperform you know, 85% of the actively managed funds that are trying to beat the market. And of that 15% uh, that beat the index funds, it's not the same 15% year after year. It just basically, it seems like it's random who ends up beating the market. So absolutely, I think that's a, an application of, or an instance of this principle that in general, the average of the predictions is the best predictor, not any individual predictor themselves. And so I, I think um, now, at, at least uh, through, I think the, the data went up to, you know, maybe 10 years ago in the Chinese stock market, interestingly, uh, at least until I haven't seen the most updated data, but for a long time, active investment mutual funds in the Chinese market seem to outperform uh, just the passive market index. And the interpretation I've seen of that is that for a long time, these professional fund managers had some privileged information about the individual companies. And so we're able to trade profitably on that information and that privileged information access was something that would be illegal in, in the U.S. market, for example. And so I don't know to what extent that is still true uh, of the Chinese market and the Chinese mutual funds, but that is kind of an exception to what I was just telling you, where for a while, at least the institutional funds in China did seem to have uh, an informational advantage. And in fact, all, you know, the Chinese stock market is a very individual trader, retail trader driven market. And it really, those retail traders seem to have been making a mistake trying to trade on their own. They should have just put, given their money to a, a mutual fund manager in China, and they would have done substantially better. Thanks for sharing that. How how interesting. Um, I see a question from um, Pan Bang Hao. Um, 
he asked, would you like to share your experiences such as how to simplify a research? Uh, my guess is that this is a question about um, kind of the topic, you know, if all models are wrong and some are useful, um, where does that point to maybe, you know, if you can elaborate on, let's say in your field, um, you know, how can one make research more fruitful? Um, you know, if you was like, what, what can academics do more of um, to correct the um, issue you pointed out that, um, you know, you kind of just ignore the wrong models when you start discussing something or doing research on something. Yeah, I, I'm going to defend uh, the wrongness to, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, we make progress in knowledge because we agree together that we're going to ignore some level of wrongness because otherwise we're just not going to be able to get beyond step one. And so I, you know, I am an economist. I, I work within the discipline of economics and finance. And you know, my the research papers that I write are not breaking radically from the mold of my discipline. And so there are all sorts of simplifications we make in our, you know, in in our research papers. And you know, I showed you that one example of of you know this utility function, this happiness function, and people making decisions as if they're maximizing the expected value of that utility function. Clearly it's it's wrong. People don't actually do that, but I've written papers that make that assumption and kind of draw out the implications of that. So I think that you know you, you should work within the confines of a discipline because as I was saying, interdiscipl truly interdisciplinary research that tries to uh, really get to the wrongness address the wrongness of the disciplines, it's very difficult to make progress in that way. But again, you shouldn't forget that, in fact, your discipline has a lot of wrongness in it. And so periodically, you should kind of look up and see um, you know, what are kind of adjacent disciplines that are studying similar questions. Uh, what are they saying about my problem? And this actually has a has a you know, analogy to some group dynamic uh, uh, kind of optimal man management of group dynamics in, at the workplace uh, that I, I think that my organizational behavior colleagues uh, here at the School of Management teach, which is, you know, what is the best way to make progress on a problem when you have a team of people? Well, what you want to happen is you should have the team break up and for each individual member or you know, a lot of small groups within the team come up with their own solution, with their own proposal, and then come back together and each team or each individual member of the group will make their proposal or present their proposal or their answer. And then you aggregate and, and kind of try to synthesize all those approaches together. So that's very much this Fox approach. And the wrong thing to do is to just start off in the big group talking together because then, well, the most senior person in the group or the loudest person in the group, uh, they're going to just dominate the conversation. And then the entire group will kind of gravitate to us in that direction. And so that's very much a hedgehog uh, type of approach that emerges when you start off the group discussion or the group effort with everybody in the same room working together. So similarly, I think in, in academic research, the economist should be doing economist things and doing economic research. And the sociologists should be talking among themselves and writing papers in the sociological tradition and, and methodology. But then every once in a while, we should get, get together and see, you know, where, where are you at and where are we at? Let, let's talk about that. So I, I think that that's kind of the, the, the most fruitful way for knowledge progression to happen. But then also, I think that uh, I was saying that uh, because knowledge production uh, is a social process, there are people who are kind of seen as senior in the, in the field, leaders of the field who have disproportionate influence in you know, how, how the field is going to progress, what the standards are, what's considered wrong, you know, not too wrong, what's considered useful enough. 
And you know, someday you may find yourself in a position where you are uh, in kind of that senior uh, leadership role in an entire discipline uh, or at least with an entire organization. And I think that's where things get pretty interesting because you do ha have the opportunity to shift some of the standards and shift some of the approaches. And you know, at that point, you would be the expert in that field. So I don't necessarily have, have advice uh, for you as to exactly you know, which way you would want to shift things. But I think that uh, what's been kind of fun for me in working on this particular project and a few other projects uh, that a few other papers that I've published recently is I felt like I, I had a little bit of an opportunity to shift the research norms of economics and finance in a little bit of, a little bit away from that Milton Friedman approach that you know don't listen to people what people have to say uh, has no value as evidence for our theories and I just, I have a few papers now saying no actually people have some pretty interesting things to say and maybe we should pay some attention to what they have to say and also some attention to what they're listening to. So if Dave Ramsey is reaching hundreds of, you know, millions of people with his podcasts and his radio shows and, and, and his books, maybe we should like listen to that. And, and we don't need to necessarily believe what he says, but let's listen and, and see if our theories need to adapt to uh, take into account what people are saying, what people are listening to. Thanks for sharing that, James. Um, and one last question for me before we wrap up. Um, you mentioned super, super Forecasting as a book that you would recommend. Um, yes. Any other book recommendations um, kind of in the spirit of, um, I, you know, it, it really sounds like we're doing also a meta talk on knowledge creation and production in general. What are the books that you would recommend, whether within that 50 personal finance book or kind of outside where you think um, can really help people become more foxes and hopefully better decision makers? Oh, not, not now you've put, put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> I, I, should, I should have uh, had a list. Just, you um, know, one or two or three um, books. Um, super forecasting, I'm, I'm definitely getting it. Uh, thanks for the recommendation. Yeah, I'm, I'm just pulling up my... Uh, Kindle app so that I, I uh, have, I, I get the title right, but <laughs> I, I would recommend, uh, there's a book by one of my co-authors, uh, I think it's called, um, so uh, co-author is Catherine Milkman, M-I-L-K-M-A-N, and it's uh, How to Change, the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be, oh. so I think that often, now, when, when I have executives come guest lecture in my classes, often they say that strategy is actually not the most important thing for organizational success or company success. It's the execution. Uh, mm -hmm. You can have the best strategy, but if your execution is terrible, then you're not going to succeed. And if the execution is great, even if the strategy is you know, not so good, uh, you can still win. And I think that uh, when it comes to even personal endeavors, there's the goal that you have and, and the insight that you have, which is important. But often the biggest obstacle is getting yourself to do these things, you know, to mm -hmm. stop wasting time, to be more productive, to, to just, yeah, just to, to, to use your, your time more effectively. And so what, what uh, Katie Milkman's, uh, yeah, I guess she's, she's publishing as Katie Milkman, not Catherine Milkman, so K-A-T-Y Milkman. Uh, and, and so she writes about kind of what the psychologists have learned about how we can get ourselves to behave like we would like to behave, uh, how to get ourselves to exercise more, how to stop procrastinating, that sort of thing. And so I think that that's, that has been a also a pretty fun book for me to, to read. Super. Well, thank you so much for um, spending your Friday evening with us, giving this very illuminating talk, um, which really helps to um, at least broaden my mind and probably many of the audience's members' minds as well. Um, and as a Yale Center Beijing tradition, especially for Zoom talks, what we would like to ask people to do if they're able to is to um, turn on your cameras. Yes, we know some people who already know the drill so that um, we can say thank you to um, Professor James Choice and also 
um, do a fun uh, group photo on Zoom for keepsake. I'm seeing people, <laughs> great, turning on their cameras. And then I'm going to say Yale. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye. For this wonderful mm -hmm. talk. Thank you.